Hello, everybody. It's Greg Wilson from Hempwood, coming from Murray, Kentucky, and we're here to talk about how you build with hemp. So our company makes hemp wood with all of the raw materials sourced from within 100 miles of the plant. Our, our hemp is Kentucky grown. Our soy flour comes from Iowa or Illinois, which is right over the Mississippi River from us. Um, the company slogan is common sense because it's common sense to us to not use trees for all of your building projects. So just a little bit about the company. I can say that the research started decades ago and it started out in a lab and it started with doing different building materials using similar processes and kind of a just throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. I started out in the um, oak flooring industry and then ended up spending 14 years in China doing bamboo flooring, eucalyptus flooring, and then recycled woods, which we ended up taking to Europe and Australia. And when this thing called the Farm Bill came about in 2014, uh, questions started rolling in about whether hemp was a viable material to put into the process to make a face grade hardwood. Our products are typically used for doing flooring, furniture, cabinetry, countertops, things of that nature. There's a lot of mill works and um, home goods and hobby woods that are made out of it as well. But in oh, the Hudson School of Ag at Murray State University, as well as the chemistry department have been playing a huge role in what we're doing because at the end of the day, hemp wood is literally agriculture plus chemistry turns into a building material. Our mission here, you can read over the slides that we have in front of you, or I can just say to do the right thing and always keep in mind what the consequences are for the earth with what you're doing, whether it's building materials or which type of vehicle you drive or just how you treat people. Um, doing the right thing in general keeps you going in the right direction. And with our specific industry that we're in, that means using something that grows fast and pulls carbon out of the air as a replacement for something that grows slow and takes many, many decades to replace if you end up cutting it down. Just like the hardwoods on the West Coast, your sequoias and your redwoods, it's a real shame when people are cutting those down or like the tropical rainforest, which right now is being slashed and burned so you can grow more soybean because of trade wars that are going on. So it's, it seems a little bit hard to comprehend, at least for us, why people would wanna take down these really beautiful old growth forests, not in the format of selective harvesting, which we absolutely support here at Hempwood, but in the format of just clear cut. Because when you clear cut a forest, it can take generations for that to get back to where it was. And if we keep doing this, at the end of the day, Mother Nature doesn't lose. We will. And it'll just take 100 or 200 years for us to be a blip on the radar like the dinosaurs were. So what goes into making hemp wood? Well, there's the process of growing the hemp. And then we break down the cell structure of the hemp and we're opening up the herd because that is the absorbent woody core. And we are impregnating that with proteins from soy flour. So once you take that and you boost up your protein content and you have a cross-linking agent that works with that boosted uh, protein content in order to solidify it into a solid product. But we have to dry it out before then in drying it out, it's just like when you fell a log in the woods and when you fell that log in the woods, then it takes a year typically to dry out to less than 20% moisture content or what you call uh, dry wood. And then you're able to cut it into your actual finished boards without it cracking or bowing or cupping too much. So we do that before we make those logs so we can quickly use them afterwards. We have to wait two weeks after we press and bake the log rather than waiting a full year. Um, so the chemistry that's going into here came from Dr. Miller at Murray State University's polymers lab. And he's been working in this field for about 20 years. Um, one of the smartest guys I know 
when it comes to polymers and chemistry and plastics and how to actually create eco-friendly adhesives or eco-friendly plastics. Because the reality is, if you want something that is waterproof and you want something that can stand up to everything that you can throw at it, it's typically petroleum-based. And that also means that it's not biodegradable. But if you're looking for something that is fit for purpose and can make your hardwood flooring water resistant, but yet still eco-friendly, there's definitely some crossover there or some overlap that can allow you to use an eco-friendly bio-based binder like we do using soy flour, but also get the water resistance so you can pass your ASTM 1037 test. The next step that goes into what we're doing here is the energy. And our energy comes from the Kentucky Lake Dam, which is supplied to our plant for our electricity. Uh, we're about, I think, five or six miles from the lake. And actually my house, the farm I live on, is actually a mile and a half from the lake. Um, but that's the main supplier of electricity in this region. And that is what supplies our plant here. We are 35 miles or so from the dam. Um, and then for our heat energy, which is required, we started out by using natural gas. Actually, we started out by using propane tanks. And then we got into natural gas because it is more eco-friendly and you can have it on a more um, readily available basis by having it piped in so you don't have to have all the trucks. And now we have migrated into using a bio burner, which the bio burner is for... Um, the bio burner turns our waste into our energy here at the plant. And so in doing that, we're able to calculate roughly what the carbon footprint is or the negative carbon aspect of growing hemp, subtract what we use here in the plant to come out with a total number. And that number, if we're operating at full capacity, which due to COVID is not the case right now, um, is about 4,100 tons per year as carbon negative, uh, which is a really proud thing that we can say. It's not 100% there, but I can say we are absolutely working towards it and doing our best to make that a reality. The last thing that goes into it is the general caring about what you're doing. Um, you can always tell when something is made by someone who likes what they're doing or likes their job because it turns out a little bit better. So keeping a positive attitude and trying to keep everybody on the same team, even in these trying times, is a major aspect of what we do here. The process, um, first we take these hemp fibers and we break open the cell structure of them. They're saturated in our all natural soy-based adhesive. And then the hemp stalks are pre-dried in what used to be a rail car which we turned on its side and hooked up the guts from five tobacco barns. So we have 75,000 CFMs of air, which are blowing across radiators, which are filled with heated liquid from our bio burner that has our um, burnt hemp in it. So when you burn the hemp, you burn it at a temperature where the carbon comes out in the format of a uh, biocarbon. And then we have scrubbers on the um, output of that. And those scrubbers actually pull 98% of the remaining carbon that could be in the air in the form of smoke. Um, and that is the most efficient way that we've found to be able to do it. Our main bio burner can do about a million BTUs or just under. Then we have a supplemental bio burner that's a transportable in the winter time. We bring it over from the Hudson School of Ag. And we can hook that up to get ourselves another oh, 400,000 BTU, something like that, which allows us to operate at full capacity. Um, the material, once it comes out of those dryers, is weighed out on what used to be a cattle scale. Now we call it a hemp scale. And then it is loaded into the press and compressed under 3,000 tons of pressure. The 3,000 tons of pressure that we have on there um, is what is able to drive it to a certain density. And then that density determines our hardness and stability of the finished product. Just like having a 200 year old um, tropical hardwood, 
we're making a four month old hemp stalk perform with similar attributes. So you don't have to cut down these beautiful Brazilian cherries in the rainforest, only to have them take 10 generations to come back to their mature status. You can do it every spring to fall. Um, the hemp wood blocks after they're pressed into this, they're baked at slightly above boiling temperature, which causes all of those proteins and the cross-linking agent to link together. And then the blocks stabilize for two weeks and are cut into their intended use, which is typically flooring is our primary. Lumber is our second most common product. And then that lumber goes into furniture cabinetry or paneling, uh, and then home goods and hobby woods, which is all the beautiful things that you see on Instagram. If you look up the hashtag hempwood, you can see all of the beautiful artistry and craftsmanship that people are making with duck calls and pens and knife handles and urns and vases and bowls and all of these different things. Um, the, the makers community has really grabbed a hold of it and led the charge on getting it out there. Um, the hemp fiber, it grows in 120 days and it's versatile for a lot of different climates, but be very careful because everybody who tries to sell you seeds tells you that their seed works everywhere. And the reality of it is that is not the case. We've tried dozens and dozens of different genetics uh, a general rule of thumb for us is that it, if it comes from a region that has the same latitude, there is a good probability that it will grow well here. But the stuff that comes from a cold area, uh, the stuff that comes from Northern Europe or Russia or things like that, or Canada, they don't tend to grow very well in the Kentucky atmosphere where it's very hot and very humid. But I can say that stuff that is grown in Southern France or Italy or Australia tends to grow pretty well in this hot, humid climate where we are. Um, I am not a scientist. I'm actually barely even a farmer. But I can say that a general rule of thumb like that gives a pretty good guidance for what people should start to look into. Um, all of our hemp does come from within 100 miles of our headquarters here in Murray, Kentucky. And that helps us lower the carbon footprint and our transportation cost. Because transportation cost of something that is big and bulky like hemp, um, once it gets to be more than 20% of what you actually pay for the material, it doesn't make sense for the farmers. And that's why you see all of your regional or localized grain structures. That's why you don't see any sort of commodity trading for wheat straw, just because everybody knows everybody in these small communities where farming or agricultural practices are your biggest employment source. And so if one person is growing wheat and using the top of it for making bread, and another person has herds of cattle or horses that need to use that, whether it's for feed or whether it's for bedding, um, you typically see each other at church or something like that. And just can make a deal without having to get somebody in Chicago involved. Um, a big thing about what we do is, and our intellectual property and technology is based on the fact that we do not decorticate. So hemp wood does not use decorticated hemp. We do not use CBD hemp. We do not use marijuana hemp or marijuana plants. What we use is the natural agricultural hemp. Uh, some people call it agricultural hemp. Some people call it industrial hemp. For us, we just call it hemp. It's usually eight to 14 feet tall. The top three feet or four feet of the plant is where the flower and the seed and the leaves are. The bottom four to seven feet of the plant is where the fiber or the stalk is. And that's what we're really after. We use the fiber, we use the herd, we use the stalk as a whole piece together. Our chemistry comes from Murray State University. Their chemistry department is involved in the Agricultural Hemp Innovation Center. And I can't tell people enough 
how much Murray State does for what we're doing, because at the end of the day, they have more experience and knowledge with legally planting hemp than any university in the United States. They got it in the ground in, I wanna say it was the end of April, beginning of May of 2014, doing test plots. And they've done dozens of test plots every single year, sometimes even hundreds of test plots um, each year since then. And they're allowed to test all of the herbicides. They're allowed to test all of the pesticides. They're allowed to test all of the fertilizers, all of the different things that as a private um, grower, you are not allowed to do because they're a research university and they have this special program through their Agricultural Hemp Innovation Center. They're allowed to do it. So they're testing how much heavy metals that hemp actually pulls out of the ground and growing plots on old industrial sites or growing plots on areas that have had heavy metals um, specifically put into the soil at certain levels. So then they're able to see what the crops pull out, such as copper, such as iron, things like that. So there's a massive amount of research and the brain trust for hempwood lies at Murray State University. And at the end of the day, from the chemistry department, the thing that matters most is fit for purpose and non-toxic. If it is fit for purpose, then you have your bonding strength, you have your moisture resistance, you have your heat resistance. And then the non-toxic element comes into play because nobody wants to live in a house that's gonna poison them. But unfortunately, most of the building materials that are made just to make a profit include the less expensive, more toxic adhesives or different heavy metals, things like that. All you have to do is look back in just about every decade of my life. I'm approaching 40 years old. I can say that every decade there's been a major scandal with building materials that were trying to make more money and in turn ended up poisoning people. If you look back to all of the building codes have changed since the 70s when lead paint was discovered to cause issues with the development of people's brains or children's brains with lead paint being in houses. And your low income places still have a significant amount of this that's left over from 40 years ago. Go to the next decade and you can see in the 80s, Armstrong, which was the largest company making asbestos ceiling tiles and flooring, had to declare bankruptcy because it was determined that asbestos going into people's houses was actually poisoning them. And that is held true. There's been court case after court case, and there's a lot of people that have had a lot of adverse effects to their health, as well as companies that have had um, significant financial problems because they were involved in that. The following decade, you started to find in the 1990s that formaldehyde was being used in your wood building materials. And so formaldehyde comes in different formats. You've got urea formaldehyde, which does not have moisture resistance. So it's an interior product only. And it has a significant off-gassing because it does not have that uh, cannibalization that you have in your phenol formaldehydes, which actually go around and scavenge the leftover formaldehyde and try to take it out. Uh, but that happens over a period of time. So the urea formaldehyde is highly sought after because it's cheap as chips. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's cheap. It's easy. It works pretty well. And the biggest factor is it's clear. So you can't see it. So the urea formaldehydes started getting banned in California and different things like that as the testing came about in the 90s and early 2000s. And that's when the technology for using bio-based adhesives, which was invented by the Greeks and the Romans thousands of years ago with what you call paper mache. Um, that's where it all started from. And then we got into this whole petroleum century or two where everything migrated to being plastics and being petroleum. Well, now it's finally coming back to say that, you know what? Burning gas in your vehicle might not be the best way. Um, somebody's making a lot of money off of combustion engines, but 
an electric engine skips the whole step of combustion. And if you can keep bio-based adhesives being used in your products, rather than having a synthetic material like formaldehyde put into your wood flooring, then why wouldn't you go that route? It might not last as long because phenyl formaldehyde, which is the dark color that you see in your flooring underlayment or in your plywood, that stuff is waterproof. But that stuff, it's a thermoset and it's a plastic and it's scavenging the formaldehyde that's in the solution and it has what's called a half-life. And so you're off-gassing at the beginning of the use of this product and say your first 30 days or 90 days is significantly higher. And then as it goes along, it becomes less and less. But do you want that build up in your house? Or would it make more sense to just use something that's clean and doesn't have these VOC emissions and doesn't have that potential risk of causing asthma or causing issues in your kids? And it all comes down to just a risk reward analysis. How much money do you want to save by buying a piece of plywood or flooring from Vietnam that has formaldehyde as compared to buying something that's from a sustainable resource like hemp that's made in the United States that doesn't have all of your dirty glues and things like that in it. And it has a hardness that's higher than any of your domestic woods. So what it comes down to is just that simple choice. Um, as we were talking about, the electrical energy from our plant is coming from Kentucky Dam. If you're looking at this slide here, you can see there's a guy fishing on the right. I have seen people catching some really big catfish in that area. So right along the dam is a decent fishing spot. Um, and that is where most of the electricity for this region comes from. Um, there are fossil fuel plants in the state of Kentucky, but I know that the local one on our grid got shut down about four years ago. And so this area has actually become a lot cleaner. And a lot of those people that were offset from the Princeton uh, coal mining jobs because of shutting down that plant are having to find other places of employment. And so we welcome those type of people to begin looking at ag tech as a natural solution to be able to create an energy like we do in our plant, or be able to create clean building materials like we do with our hemp wood flooring. So the care part, you know what this is about? We actually give a shit about the environment. Excuse my language there, but we've gone to extreme lengths to be able to use our waste material to turn into our energy for our facility. And then being able to work with that circular production cycle or circular economy where our local guys grow the hemp, we can create our energy. And I can even say that the, um, the local utility company came out here to visit recently and said, hey, um, what happened to all of your natural gas use? We wanted to come out and see if you guys are still actually operating. Uh, that was just within the last couple of weeks. And I just gave him a big old grin and said, yeah, we're still going. So caring about what you're doing, the people, the environment, everything around you is what actually matters here. And so that's what we find to be our best customers. The people who use Hempwood are the people that actually care. Well, now that we've talked about kind of how we do it and why we do it, let's talk about the product. So what is hempwood? Hempwood is a interior non-structural hardwood. And the reason it's a interior is because we don't want to use formaldehyde glue. And that's what we found to be the exterior quality bonding agent for it. We've still got pieces of uh, test material that we made three years ago sitting outside. And yeah, the formaldehyde glue, it yellows a little bit, but they're still holding together through three years of Kentucky weather. Um, but that's not the, the path we chose. And so we don't wanna make something that's done the wrong way just to try to make it so it can be fit for purpose. It's something that's not our primary market. 
The non-structural element, the reason we're non-structural is in 18 years, we've never figured out how to take these different types of materials we develop and actually make a structural non-face grade product out of it that has a solid business case behind it. A two by four is typically three to $5. Even in the crazy times of this past year, it's been eight to $10 for one two by four. Whereas the numbers pencil out for making a hempwood two by four of about $25 a piece. So you've got to be either super rich or absolutely crazy to frame a house with oak as compared to pine because the price difference is five to one. Well, you would have to be just as crazy to try to frame a house with hempwood when the price difference is five to one. Um, so that's why we're an interior non-structural. The reason that we are a face grade product is that a face grade hardwood is what people look at. And so while we were developing this and saying, hey, does it make sense to make an OSB panel? Does it make sense to make a two by four? We just took it to the market and said, hey, what should we get into here? And people said, and most of the customers and everyone that we were around said, if you can't see it, then how are people going to show off what they're actually buying? Because it makes a statement when you put a hemp wood floor in your business, or you put a hemp wood floor in your office, or you put a hemp wood floor in your home. It's telling people what you stand for. And that's just the same way with driving a Tesla. People buy a Tesla not only because it's good for the environment, but it gives them an eco boost. And it actually allows them to have a conversation piece of saying, hey, look, this boardroom table that we're meeting on right now is made out of a sustainably harvested, locally purchased piece of hemp. And so having something that people can see makes all the difference in the world in a product like this, that we're a new company. I guess we can still say new. This is our third year in production um, in a new location, which I'm not originally from Kentucky. I'm from Maryland, but Murray State University kind of pulled me in. And now this is my home in a new industry, because let's face it, hemp has only been nationally legal for three years with a new product. And so the amount of variables between those four things have killed just about all of the hemp companies because there's too many things coming at you. There's too much happening at the same time. You take your eye off the prize and then you end up not making it through. So what we've decided to do is to stick to flooring and furniture with face grade non-structural timbers because those are the easiest way to pinpoint what the market is and get it to the customer. So hempwood being a face grade hardwood. As a rule of thumb, we're going after the white oak market. White oak is one of your more sought after domestic hardwoods. And so in being one of your more sought after, it has some moisture resistance, but it's not exterior, just like hempwood. It has a higher hardness than your red oak, which is kind of Red oak is almost a softwood. I mean, it is oak, yes, but I can say that it's a lot softer than your white oak and it is not really wanted to be used. It's usually your price point product for flooring and furniture. Um, the red color is valued in Asia, uh, even though people don't know the technical attributes of it, but it splits a lot. It's hard to work with things like that as compared to white oak. So we are a substitute for white oak and white oak encompasses greater than 50% of your better and best hardwood flooring industry in the United States. And so if we're going after the top dog, which is your white oak, then that's what we have to outperform at a similar price. So you can make flooring, you can make cabinetry, you can make countertops, you can make furniture, which is some of my favorite. I love building 
cabinets or tables and things like that. And you can do shelving. There's all different types of shelving and displays that we're starting to see pop up all over the internet that's made out of hemp wood. The one last thing that Alyssa, who puts together all this information, and I'll give a shout out to my team here with James, who does the sales, and Alyssa, who does our communication, and Tommy and Dale that run the two different plants that we have here. We do have one hemp wood facility that makes the lumber, and then we have one finished good facility that makes the flooring and cabinetry and paneling and things like that. But the one thing Alyssa wanted me to make sure everybody knows is you're not going to frame a house with hemp wood. And that is because it'll cost you five times as much to frame with hemp wood as compared to pine. And so there's no point in even really looking at that discussion unless you come and say, I got a blank check. I want to build my house out of hemp wood. I'm going to frame the entire thing with it. Um, it's not going to work as a business case. So you can see, even though the words are a little bit messed up on this presentation, on the far left is the lumber. In the middle is the flooring here. On the right top is our paneling. On the bottom left is our cabinet kits. In the middle bottom is our turning blanks. And then on the right bottom is our table kits. So you can look at our catalog on the website and you can review all of these and choose what you want. Give us a shout. You can send an email to sales at hempwood.com. You can give us a call at 888-338-1235. And yes, all of those are Fibonacci numbers. Or you can simply go on the website and order directly from there. So getting into our flooring. Um, the flooring that's made out of hemp wood, it's built on an engineered format. And the reason it's built on an engineered format is because hemp wood is too hard to nail. And if you put a solid floor over a concrete subfloor, you're going to have bowing and cupping and different problems that are all derived from having hydrostatic pressure coming up from the soil that is below your base floor concrete during the rainy season. And the hydrostatic pressure comes up, it sits on the bottom of the board, and then it causes it to buck. Our plywood that we use as the core is no added formaldehyde, and it's West Virginia poplar. So it's made from our friends at Columbia Forestry Products. Uh, they've been great supporters of what we do and how we do it. And it has the hemp wood as the top layer, which is the same format as a engineered white oak flooring. That same format means that if you can install engineered oak flooring, you can install hemp wood flooring. Uh, it has a tongue and groove format. It is over 2000 on the Janka hardness rating. Uh, a lot of our test results come in 2200 for the riff sawn and up to 2,600 for the plane saw, um, which our logs can be cut in a similar fashion to a domestic white oak log, where you can do plane sawn that gets your highest yield on a log, but it has your um, lower value to it. And then you can get your quarter sawn or your riff sawn, and your quarter sawn or riff sawn has a lower yield in a regular log but it has a significantly higher value. You can nail it down, you can glue it down, or you can even, if you're crafty about it, you can take a caulk gun and get your uh, wood adhesive, like your, um, oh, which one would I use? You can get your quick grabs. You can get a lot of your different wood adhesives that you have there in a tube format and run a bead of glue into the groove and then put it together as a floating floor that's actually glued the tongue into the groove. Uh, bona sealers and bona finishes are what is recommended. And we do sell from our factory. Our primary product is the unfinished, which means it does not have a coating and you can do your own custom colors at home. Or there is the natural pre-finished, which the natural pre-finished is, um, probably our second biggest seller. Uh, a lot of the dry environments, 
we still recommend selling the unfinished too. So I can acclimate on site before you're putting a coating on it. Um, and then we have our bourbon. And that is an ode to our home state of Kentucky, where it is a medium brown. Um, it's probably our favorite color or most requested color that goes out. We also have our custom color collection, which includes the bourbon, the honey, and the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic is a white wash. The honey is kind of a earthy, oaky tone. And then the bourbon is your medium brown. Um, those are our custom color collection. And you can find all of that stuff on our website or in our catalog. And you can find the installation instructions under the document section on our website. So the selling point of Hempwood. Well, the selling point of Hempwood is that it's American made. It's eco-friendly. It is the most sustainable building material that is out there. It is price competitive with your better and best American white oak flooring, which is 50% of your hardwood flooring market. It is consumer safe, meaning we don't put a bunch of nasty glues and a bunch of toxins inside of there. And so, although I wouldn't recommend it, you could eat off your floor and it's durable. The durable element comes from the moisture resistance which is not only a combination of the hemp and the adhesive inside of it, but also the sealers and coatings that you put on and the hardness, because if you go online and you can see people taking hammers and hitting it and actually taking flamethrowers, or I wouldn't call it a flamethrower, a soldering gun and trying to burn it, your density determines the flammability and the hardness of the product. And so, because it is super hard and it is fire resistant to the tune of double the actual amount of uh, the highest requirement for commercial settings, hemp wood works fantastic in commercial applications or inside of your home where you don't want to have all these nasty VOCs going on. Facts about hemp wood. Is it waterproof? No. It's not waterproof. In order to be waterproof, it would have to be plastic. It is water resistant, especially when you put the proper sealers on it. Um, so what if you're looking for different colors that are not offered by us? That's easy. The unfinished option allows you to paint your own picture of whatever custom color that you want and still get the hemp wood material that you desire in your home. What's the workability of hemp wood? Well, it sands very well. It actually sands better than your traditional woods because we're compressing soy flour into there, which is essentially a wood fill. It stains very well with your oil-based stains. The water-based stains are just like regular wood where you have to do a grain, ways, grain raise wetting solution, then sand it down, dry it out, and then stain it again. If you want to go through all that, it does work, but I can say it's a lot of extra work to it. And that's why oil-based stains are usually used on wood products because it doesn't have that same swell mechanism. Um, what can you make with hemp wood? Man, you can make whatever you want. As long as you could use a domestic hardwood like oak, then you could make golf clubs out of it. I've seen people make bow and arrows out of it. I've seen people turning bowls and cups. I've even seen a coffin, actually several coffins that have been made out of hemp wood. So if you go on Instagram, which seems to be the primary maker's source of sharing what they're doing and just look up hemp wood, you can get a great idea as what's happening there. Where can you buy hemp wood? Hempwood.com. If you give us, go to the website, you can get our email address. You can order straight on the website. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you can give us a call. All that information is on hempwood.com and it, it allows us to get it out there. We also have a factory rep program and a dealer program. So we have factory reps in various parts of the country that go out and preach the good word of hempwood. And they are telling everybody what we do and getting samples in people's hands and getting it specified for commercial projects and getting it into your local flooring shops and things like that. So we can refer you to those people if you want somebody locally to talk to, 
Or if you give us a call, we can show you where our dealer network is across the United States. We've now got over two dozen dealers in the US that are carrying hempwood that you can go to their place and talk to them about it and touch it and feel it and see it and then order directly from them. Uh, last one is if anybody still has any questions, you can give us a ring. You can send us an email. You can even submit an inquiry on the website. And then last but not least, here's all of our contact details. What I can say is it takes a village to make something like this happen. And so we do need people like you guys to buy the product and use it in your jobs. So we've gotten a few questions that I was asked to address on here. Uh, and then a few different elements of what the product stands for. I just wanted to kind of reiterate. And so our core function with Hempwood is that it, it is made in the USA as a sustainable building material that has performance attributes that exceed its natural competitors, such as its hardness and its flame spread or flammability. And it is price competitive with American White Oak. So it works really well for the commercial settings like our customers at BMW who are doing some showrooms for it with it and they're doing some car components. Uh, Target in San Francisco is doing an eco-friendly display setup and hopefully that goes well and they spread it to all their different places. Um, by the way, if anybody who's listening to this wants to start going into their local shops, their local stores or even their local Target and say, hey, where's the hemp wood at? You can drive demand for our product to get spread everywhere. It does really well in its small retail shops like your cannabis shops and your coffee shops because people there wanna have brand awareness of what they're doing and they wanna tie that to the eco-friendly movement or the sustainability movement. So that's why commercial companies are using it all the time. I can say that for residential applications, the main driver of residential applications is the air quality in your home. And the air quality in your home has a direct effect on how productive you are for work, how your child's brain develops in those fundamental years of development, and actually how you feel or how you look or your whole output on life. So a positive attitude, which drives everything that happens to you in life, starts with what's surrounding you. Not only your friends and family, but also what your atmosphere is made of, what your atmosphere is built out of. So if you live on a beautiful farm that has flowers in the springtime, you're gonna wake up and have a positive attitude because of how pretty it looks, how good it smells, and then what that does, well, what goes into your house has the exact same format. So some questions that we got. Can hemp wood be upcycled? Absolutely. We're already upcycling the secondary product from the hemp plant to make hemp wood. And then we've seen a lot of our customers who will build, say, like Tony at iHemp Michigan. He is putting on a concert with a new hemp wood guitar and he built a hempwood stage that he's gonna be tearing down after that. And from my understanding, they're going to be then converting that into tabletops to be used in their office. Can it be recycled and composted? It absolutely can. Uh, it hasn't been around long enough to know the exact life cycle of how long it takes to compost. I can say that the hemp can compost in uh, two to five years on its own. I can say that due to the density of it, when we compress it together, it is much more moisture resistant with the adhesive in it. And so it will take longer than that, but it hasn't been around long enough to do anything more than the speculation of accelerated aging tests, which are the 1037 A's. And you can see how long it will last as a flooring that's not in the elements. So interior flooring, you're looking at 40, 60, 80 years. Uh, some of that could even go to 100. When you're actually submitting it to all of the elements, you would be looking 
at a recycling time period of somewhere between five and 20 years if you buried it in your backyard. Um, how long does the flooring last? I think I just answered that, uh, but thanks Jake for asking that one. Uh, you should be looking at a lifetime. So is that 50 years, is that 100 years? It's somewhere in that uh, ballpark. It all depends how many times you're trying to change the color. What's the price difference for hemp wood flooring? Say if you have a thousand square feet of flooring that you need to do. Well, it is directly competitive with your domestic manufactured white oak. So our flooring is eight to $10 a square foot. Uh, that's what we sell it for out of the factory here. If you're my buddy, you can give me a call. We can talk about trying to work a, some sort of a deal there. But uh, that's the same price that all of our domestic manufacturers are selling their wide plank, wide oak flooring. And so in that case, you'd be looking at 1,000 square feet would cost you 8000 to $10,000. Your installation varies on um, where you're getting it at. And so I've seen anywhere from $5 to $10 for your install. Um, can anyone install hemp wood flooring or only a trained professional? That's a trick question because if I say anyone and someone does it wrong, then I'm wrong. But if I say that if you can install a engineered white oak floor, then you can install a engineered hemp wood floor, then that leaves it into the actual craftsman's hands of how well they're gonna do with it. You've got the glue down or nail down part, which is the installing of it. And that is the exact same as what you would do for a white oak floor. But the sanding and staining and coating has a wide variety of means of going about that. And so I do recommend that you practice on a couple of extra boards off to the side of what is your most appropriate staining method. For me, I like to go through and stain sections of say one to 200 square feet at a time and then run a buffer over them. And it really massages and smooths out that color. It makes it a very uh, smooth looking stain color where one board goes to the next and it all marries up really well. Um, I know there's a lot of people that squeegee and I know there's a lot of people that have different methods of doing that. As far as coatings go, I prefer two coats of sealer on it. A bonus sealer is what we've been working with and works best. Two coats of bonus sealer, one coat of Bona HD traffic for residential and two coats of Bona HD traffic for a commercial setting. So if there are any more questions, you can reach out to us, sales at hempwood.com, get on the website, check out our social media. And whenever you have to make a decision, always keep in mind all of the stakeholders. And it's not always just people, but it's the earth as well. Well, thanks for having me here at the US Hemp Building Summit. And please let me know what else I can do to help because we need you guys to be our customers. And so we're relying on everybody who's listening to this to put hemp wood into their next project.